What's the worst thing about sports? That's right, all those unnecessary breaks in play. But you can make them all better by using Grubhub. Grubhub has every food you can possibly crave, from national favorites to local spots. Grab your first order from the Grubhub app, or visit Grubhub.com. That's Grubhub.com. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. That's zero food delivery fees from your favorite restaurants. Visit GoForGrubhub.com slash Amazon for terms and details. Go for Grubhub. Your favorite podcast, Therapy for Black Girls, is celebrating five years of empowering conversations as we continue to make mental health and wellness accessible. In addition to weekly chats with some of your favorite mental health professionals and other experts, we've flipped through the pages of your favorite romance novels with author Tia Williams, checked in with Grammy Award winning artist Michelle Williams, and talked hurdles in sports, motherhood, and mental health with Olympic athlete Natasha Hastings. From our team to your podcast app, join us in celebrating five years of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. Check it out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Hello, you beautiful people out there in podcast land. Thank you for consuming this show. There are millions of choices for you to spend your time, and the fact that you are doing this, supporting this very podcast, supporting the guest on there, I cannot thank you enough. And I know that maybe sounds just trite to thank you right up top, but trust me, this is meaningful to me. And this is meaningful to you because you are coming here to listen to people who are involved in independent music, punk and hardcore and indie rock and emo and all of those things that we hold so near and dear to our hearts. And I am so excited to have this discussion to bring to you. It is with Jason Mazzola. He plays in a band called, or played in a band called Count Me Out. He currently plays for a band called Cloak Dagger, which, by the way, I'm going to play a new song of theirs that will be leading into the interview, and I will include a link in the show notes because they have a new 7-inch that's coming out that you can pre-order, so please go visit that link after you listen to the song and maybe listen to the interview, and you will be able to, uh, yeah, pre-order that 7-inch. So please do it because Cloak Dagger is a great band. But anyways, Jason, like I said, said vocalist for count me out plays in cloak dagger and he also hosts a podcast called where it went which is a deep dive into the revelation records catalog and uh, him and a couple of friends go deep on every single release that rev has touched and uh, they've been doing it now for the better part of a year and a half and uh, i just love jason i actually spoke to him i don't know two some odd years ago in regards to coming on the show and he was like i don't know <laughs> I was like, you'll have a fun time, I promise. And uh, he just wasn't uh, really interested in it. And I get it. Like, there's definitely times where people uh, have asked me to do stuff, and I'm like, ah, I don't know, not right now. But anyways, I was diligent and uh, got Jason on, because Count Me Out is a huge band for me personally. Just done so many cool things within the context of that whole early 2000s, you know, hardcore explosion, especially in the more traditional sense of things. And uh, yeah, plus all they do is rip off Chain of Strength. And I love Chain of Strength. (laughs) So we talk a lot about that. But let's talk about the ways that you can support the show, because you can do it for free. So first and foremost, you can leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, you can follow the show on Spotify, and you can leave a star rating on there. All of those things help in the eyes of the great algorithm, as it were. And uh, you can also email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. I love to hear from you in regards to guest ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, The show will be celebrating our 10-year anniversary in episode 520. I'm really excited for that for a multitude of reasons. One, the fact that I've been doing this for, you know, as long as like my child has been alive, which is wild to say. But the fact that uh, I've been able to work with so many cool people and um, just have a really, really fun time in bringing these interviews to you. Because uh, all I do is look at this like an audio zine. And this gives the appropriate context for people. And it gets, um, I don't know, it just, I find so much value out of this. 
because I know if I were on the consumption side of things, like I love to listen to interviews. I listen to so many podcasts. I'm not like one of those people who, uh, you know, just produces a podcast and then uh, doesn't listen to any shows. Like that is my life's blood. So anyways, I'll get off my soapbox, but that is uh, the ways that you can support the show. Let's talk to Jason, and here is a clip of one of the new songs off of their upcoming 7-inch. Like I said, you can pre-order it with the show notes link that I will include in there. And then, uh, yeah, here we go. Let's talk to Jason. Like I've punished you in the past on social media, which is so fun that we can do this to people's art that we respect. Where it's like, I just really like your pant. I just want to do that. But I, and I've often expressed to anybody who's willing to listen that 110 and Permanent are some of the best quote unquote traditional hardcore records to come out of the early 2000s Russia bands in that era. And namely, in my opinion, because of your kind of pissed approach in regards to your vocal styling. But on top of it, without sacrificing the kind of underpinnings of melody. And ultimately, the conclusion that I personally landed on was that, okay, you guys are basically the chain of strength of the East Coast, which I don't know if that is what you were trying for or if that is a compliment to you. But do you feel like that either has that been said to you before or is that something where it's that was really definitely the error or the area which we were trying to land in? For sure. Thank you also for saying that you like those records, because that means a lot to me. And anybody that does reach out to me on social media and says, hey, I like your records, it's really gratifying. And I can't say how much I do appreciate that. It's just that in this era, we can now do that. Whereas before you, I couldn't reach out to Walter and say, shit, this quicksand is fucking fire. I'm on a jog right now and listening to Slip. But yeah, I definitely see the chain of strength comparison because that's what we were going for. Especially with 110. That's when I was just, I think it. When we recorded 110, I was strictly listening to Chain of Strength, Youth of Today, Circle Storm, Inside Out. And that's pretty much what we loved. And also through the lens of my voice is rougher than that. And so it was a learning experience to try to figure out how we sounded. And also the fact that you not so subtly dropped a Circle Storm reference is quite comical. We, so we just did this episode on, this, on a Civ two song, seven inch a social climber record for the where it went podcast and then someone said you forgot about the circle storm seven inch and i thought i totally forgot i used to just listen to that seven inch nonstop. but oh it's incredible i yeah i was fortunate enough that i uh, as i started to go to shows when i was 15 or 16 i think i literally saw every circle storm show because they played like six or seven they weren't well so you saw them javier also saw them and i they were scheduled to play the east coast and they were on the flyer for the first better than thousand show yeah and they didn't make it but i was so crushed because i was just looking forward to seeing them so bad because i was just chain crazy i still am at my age now but i think going back to count me out with permanent i was just getting all of this with 110 i was just listening to those bands only strictly youth crew bands and then the youth crew bands that were around at that time, the 10 yard fight, fast break in my eyes. But with permanent, I mean, I was listening to anything and everything that wasn't hardcore. If it was everything from Bell and Sebastian and Swerve Driver and My Bloody Valentine and New Order and all the bands that ripped them off and were the new version of that, that had a release on an indie that no one's ever heard of because I was dating someone that worked at a record store. And so I would go up at the, to the counter with a stack of CDs and she would ring me up for $10 and I would take on this wealth of new music to dive into. I love, I love that because that, that record store connection where you are able to pull in influences that are outside of your sphere. Of, yeah. It's so important and it's so cool when you're able to, whether you actually, yes, I'm sure there's elements where you were like, man, it would be really cool if we had some atmospheric guitar and count me out that sounds like (laughs) my bloody Valentine, but there's no way you're going to do that. But there are certain elements that you can bring to the table that will inform that. Yeah. Now with the new generation of 
bands that are out. I just think that they've nailed it as far as just taking anything that they want to incorporate into what they call hardcore punk related and just boom, there it is. And that's what it sounds like. And I love that. And it's something that I don't think we had the foresight to even try to do the same way. So, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because you're like, we're, and especially too, I completely identify with that feeling of looking at bands that exist now where you have this large wealth of knowledge, aka the internet, to be able yeah, to, it's true. to have, but just look at where it's like, wait, you're 14 years old and you're already good? I'm like, we were <laughs> terrible for yeah. arguably a long time. And you can pull this off when you're that young. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it rules. Um, yeah, that's cool. Glad the uh, the chain of, I, I knew the chain of strength comparison was not going to bum you out. So. No, dude, I love it. And that's what we wanted with 110. I wanted to sound like Chain. And I was so disappointed that when I did the vocals for that record that I didn't sound like Kurt. Like I straight up thought I wanted to sound like Kurt and I wanted to have that thing that he has in his voice that like makes you almost, it's just, almost reaches out and grabs your emotions and makes you, you can feel what he's saying. The same, Zach has the same thing yeah. uh, in his voice where you just feel it the same way that he feels it singing it. And I wanted that to be the case with Count Me Out, but I also wanted it to have that same reflection in his voice that Kurt has that I don't have. But And I was disappointed by that. So uh, you got you, Jason. You're okay. Yeah, but it took me a second to learn that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It did. I think that's a part and parcel of growing up and perspective and all those important things that older people tell us when we're young and dumb. Yeah, that's true. That's very, that's <laughs> we're, of putting the focal point on you, were you actually born and raised in Richmond or did you grow up somewhere else? No. So I was a military brat and uh, I moved around everywhere. I was born in, at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then moved to Tucson, Arizona, and then moved to San Antonio, and then moved to... I think a different Air Force base in Texas somewhere. And then into, then I moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is where I spent middle school and high school. I spent ninth grade in Colorado Springs. Got it. And yeah. it, it is interesting how a lot of, I mean, there's a few people that I know that you, we are mutual friends with that have maybe had that experience and then end up in the Richmond greater sort of DC area that have all had that military connection. And so it, it is funny to have that transient nature be able to be duplicated, especially with the idea of touring in a band. Yeah, for sure. But I think that I hated it when we moved, when I moved from ninth grade, my dad was stationed in, at, in Alabama for one year and I was so pissed because we had to leave my friends in Colorado Springs with someone where I already had a crew. I was already into punk stuff. And I was, I loved that aspect of my life at the time. But then when we moved, that was all uprooted and I was just pissed, just nonstop mad. And, but that's when I really dove into hardcore and I shouldn't say hardcore. That's when I really dove into punk was that year that I spent in Alabama. And then we moved from there to back to Alexandria, Virginia, which is just right outside of DC in 1992, which was just, that's the epicenter of punk core at the time, at least. Yeah. I, I, so, yeah. Was the, so what was the family structure like growing up? I know, like you were saying, your dad was obviously in the military. It was mom at the house taking care of you and you have brothers and sisters. Yeah. I have an older brother. He's four years older than me. And I have a younger sister that's 10 years younger than me. My brother was into hip hop. He wasn't so much into hardcore and punk shows, but he would go with me to some of the shows, especially the free ones in DC. He would go with me to see Fugazi and then he'd go with me to the Lollapaloozas every year because we would go to those even when I was into hardcore and fully invested in it. I would still go to Lollapaloozas and have fun because it was fun. But uh, yeah, my mom and dad are still together and they're right now just being amazing grandparents for our baby that was just born in January. But uh, I'm so thankful to have them in my life and as support through all that time. And it's so, I almost feel guilty because I was so angry towards them about all the moving we did, but in retrospect, they were just so good to me. Yeah. No, that's cool that you can yeah. have, even though you don't, didn't understand, un didn't understand the circumstances at the time, besides the fact that we got to move for my dad's dumb job or whatever. Yeah. Just the idea that you can look back and be like, I understand the choices and stability that was afforded to me because of that. Yeah. But a story I like to tell is when we, so we made that move and my parents knew I was going to be pissed. And so they rented a house with a half pipe in the backyard. 
because they knew we were only going to be there for a year. And they were like, you're going to love this house that we have. There's a half pipe in the backyard for you. Still just, yeah, fuck this move. But then totally. totally. So awesome. How cool is that? That they did that for me. And yeah, I skated the shit out of that half pipe. That was like my, that's what gave me happiness for that year. And you have friends that would want to come over and skate that half pipe because they were used to doing it for the people that had it before they rented it out. So. Right. That was the. That was your, your salvation. That was the bargain that your parents had to be like, yeah. all right, Jason's <laughs> yeah. going to be such a pain in the butt. What are we going to do? How about a half pipe? All right. That sounds like, good. Let's just move to Alabama, give him a half pipe and throw some Bad Brains tapes at him and see what happens. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Then we're just going to get a super weird adult. That's uh, exactly <laughs> what's going to happen. Hey, job well done. They did it. <laughs> That's amazing. So I- I'm guessing with you bouncing around, there is that nature of always being the new kid in class and kind of uh, being able to not reinvent yourself, but always slide in and be like, oh yeah, there's Jason, the new kid or whatever. Did yeah. you feel like that? Or was that hard for you to wedge yourself into these longstanding friendships? Was it hard? Let's see. For that move, when I moved from Colorado Springs to Alabama, I was just on fuck everybody. I just didn't want to be around anybody. I just wanted to go by myself and I wanted to skate. And that's the only thing I cared about. I didn't even care about making friends, but I did make some friends when I was there. One of which took me to my first show. So thank God that we did move there when we did. But when I went to Colorado, when we went back to Alexandria, Virginia, it took a second because people there had grown up together. They all knew each other. And then there I was coming in junior year in Alexandria, Virginia, this weirdo skate kid that nobody knew. But yeah, I made friends easily there. And some of those friends I still have now. I went to the same high school with Peter Tesaurus from Be Well. And he's the one that took me to my first show. And here we are, 2022. And I still see him on a regular basis. No, it's cool that you... Especially too, there is that exotic element where, especially if you are a person that is connected to something that you don't look like the other kids where it's, oh, is this, is this going to be cool? Or is this guy going to be like super weird and lame? Like what's the vibe? Yeah. Yeah. I felt that, but also I think I fit in. Okay. At least there's, it's so strange at my high school and I brought this up to someone else before, but four on was a big band at my high school for some reason. And Worlds Collide was a big band at my high school. It's just wherever, I don't know how those tapes got passed around, but they got passed around and everyone was at least on the same page, even if they weren't fully all in on skating or on hardcore or punk. They were at least aware of it and knew what it was. But I guess that's the perks of living outside of D.C. at the time. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Was the, so did you care about school? What sort of person did you find yourself being? Like, were you an academic? Were you a sports kid? Were you a video game guy? Like, where did you find yourself? I was just skate kid, art kid. I would, uh, I was in advanced placement art classes. And those are the classes I did care about. But those classes, what they would do is I remember they'd just put us in a room and they would give us a stereo and then we could just play whatever music we wanted to and just do whatever artwork we wanted to. But uh, as far as academic classes, I would just take them and just, I just took them because you had to take them. I wasn't moved by it. I wasn't a good student. I wasn't a bad student. I was very average. I just cared about art and skating and punk. And, and that was it. That was my priorities. I was really just there just because it was something I felt obligated to do. My senior year, I remember halfway through the school year, someone said, why don't you just skip class and come with me, come with us down to Denny's? And I thought, skip class? No way. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do I don't want to do that. But uh, yeah, I did. And it was fine. And no one cared. And yeah, I think that maybe the have the end of my senior year, much like everybody else, I just didn't care as much. But right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that there was an element of you towing the line and like getting decent enough grades to where you could keep your parents off of your back, but then still be able to do what you wanted to do without being like, oh, Jason's grounded for a month because he got an F or whatever. Yeah, no, no way. I just remember that we had the night before the SATs, I went to a show at the 930 club and I did horrible on the SATs the next day. And I remember being like, I probably shouldn't have gone to that show. I love when you have those really specific memories of making that decision of, okay, I probably should study for that science test, but like, dude, Converge is in town or whatever. Like you just, you do those and then you're like, oh yeah, like I'm exhausted. I'm doing terrible at this, but SATs, that's a good, that's i I'm glad you made that decision. Yeah. Yeah. So it took a second. And then after I graduated, I, I didn't, I don't know. I went to community college because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do as far as studies go but i knew i wanted to go to college but um 
I think at the time I was too scared to pursue a career in art because it was so unstable. And what were you going to do with an art degree? Were you going to be a sculptor? But I eventually, that's the path I went down and things are fine as they are. And uh, was there, because especially in connection with the military, there's always that idea that, oh, the household must have been run a, a tight, like a tight ship. And yeah. Was there any of that element where, you know, your father or your household was extremely strict or was that not your experience? No, my parents rule. Like, they were strict, but they were never so strict where I was like infuriated with them or I felt like I had to rebel against them. It was just like, yeah, I just didn't want to disrespect them. So yeah, they must've been strict in some sense, but at the same time, like I just never really felt that much anger towards them. My dad recently, he's seen Cloak Dagger play, which was insane to me that he would come out and see us, but he did. And it was great. We got tattooed together five years ago. Oh, so. nice. <laughs> That's sick. I love it to hear sick. that. Yeah, I don't know. And I just think that my parents are, I think that I was fortunate that my parents, and yes, my dad is in the military, but he's also like super cool. And I think that since he's my dad, he sometimes takes a little bit of time for you to realize that not everybody has super cool parents. Talking about Ramona, who was born in January, I ran into a friend of mine. And uh, I was telling him I was nervous about having kids. And he just, he also has kids. And he was like, let me tell you what, all you have to do is a better job than your parents did. And I was like, there's no fucking way I'm going to be able to do better than my parents. <laughs> they were amazing. And he was like, oh, my parents were awful. So yeah, for me, <laughs> so you're like, for me, it was nothing. Bad, yeah, you're like bad scale, bro. I can't, <laughs> this is tough. I'm going to be an absolute failure. Rockabilia.com is the place for you to buy all of the band merchandise that you could possibly want for yourself, for your friends, for your family. But before I go on, use the promo code 100 words or less. That will get you 10% off your order. That's the number 100 words or less. You know, you, you can spell, you can read, <laughs> but they are the place. All officially licensed stuff. The bands get paid. Everybody wins in this scenario, including you, the consumer, the ultimate person that should care the most about where your money is going to. You are supporting independent business. You are supporting the band. You are supporting this very podcast when you use that promo code 100 words or less. Whew. You're just you're being such a good human when you are doing that. So Rockabilia, half a million items. They ship it from the Midwest. It gets you lickety split. And I can't tell you how much I love this company and I love the fact that I get to work directly with them to make sure that you are aware of their services. So again, 100 words or less is the promo code. 10% off, it gets you your entire order. And thank you very much, Rockabilia, for your continued support. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. We've all been there. You know, life's going good. Relationships are awesome. Works great. Family life's great. And then all of a sudden, you know, some things start to happen. A wheel falls off. You, uh, you know, maybe have some issues at work. And then all of a sudden you're in a spot where you feel bogged down and you might not know who to turn to. You're like, I don't want to bug my family or friends with this stuff. That is why I wholeheartedly endorse therapy. I've used it myself and I think it is an incredible tool. That is why I love working with BetterHelp because if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. That is the key point. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge if you feel like it. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can absolutely get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash words today and you get 10% off your first month. Please use the code and that way you can sign up with BetterHelp and live a more empowered life. That's betterhelp.com slash words. Try therapy. Like you said, you didn't feel confident that there was a road in regards to the career in the arts, as it were. So what sort of, I guess, life path were you envisioning yourself going on from a career perspective? Because obviously, I'm going to guess you weren't like, yes, I'm going to be a full-time touring musician in a hardcore band. Oh, it's, Ray, you would think that. I would I, think that. I, know. I, I was like, I seriously it was just like, I just want to tour. Yeah. I just want to play shows. I just want to do, <laughs> I want to do this for life. But naively, because you can't do that, you can't do this for life. Even the best bands can't do it forever. But yeah, as far as art goes, I just, I guess I would just wanted a career in design. I was, I just thought they would be cool to just get a career in design and have an have a office job and just have 
that just be my normal routine is to just go in and do design work for corporate companies. I don't care. I thought that was fine with me. I didn't have any aspirations to do anything independently. But oddly enough, all of the design stuff I truly learned on my own doing flyers and record layouts and CD layouts for friends. And that's really how I learned how to do design properly as much as I can do it now. You learned by doing. Yeah. Yeah. And that was more valuable to me than most of the classes that I took at BCU. So yeah, no, that and honestly, I think that's why people like you and I and many of friends care about this so much because not only did it give us a lifelong hobby, so to speak, but the idea that there were so many of these at real life applications that, of course, as we were learning them, we would never have articulated it as such, but we would be like, oh, wow, I did learn a few things by putting on a show for five people or whatever. Yeah. Oh, my God. I booked a show once and it was such a disaster. Please expand some more. The show was, I'm going to get the lineup wrong, but it was a Count Me Out played, Collision, Darkest Hour, For the Living, Darkest Hour was the headliner. And I just, I threw the show together because Collision was in town and they needed a show. And so I wanted to put it together for them. And it was just, man, it was just bad. I was just bad at handling everything that comes with booking a show. You have so many people coming at you from different angles and are just asking you a million questions. And then the promoter, I shouldn't say the promoter, I was the promoter, but the person that owned the club was telling me, you can't have any more people on the guest list. All your friends are trying to sneak in the back of this club. And I remember telling my friends, please don't sneak in the back of the club and just pay for the show. And it got time, it got to the end of the show and I had the money for the night, which was not hardly anything. And so what I thought was the best thing to do was Gilman style. Everybody gets $60. And, um, no one was, everyone was bummed on that. Obviously, Darkest Hour was a headliner. They drew a lot of people. They deserved more than that $60, but I was so new to the game and didn't under, I didn't really understand how things worked. Totally. Yeah. You were just like, this seems like a good idea. So here you go. You guys stoked? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. It was a learning experience of, I don't need to book shows. So everyone that does book shows, I can't, I can't thank those people enough for putting up with all of that bullshit. I've had good friends. That's what they do is promote shows and they thrive off it the same way that I would thrive off of, I don't know, doing art for a band or something, but it's just, it's hard. It's a tough job and it's a thankless job. Yeah, It's not a job that every, that people are like, I really appreciate what you did. It's more, man, it's so I can't get me plus three into the show. Is that cool? Totally. You're like, there's 10 paid. Can you please put me the cash up? Come on. This is ridiculous. And like you said, skateboarding was obviously the entry point for you in regards to punk and hardcore and everything like that. Once you started to go one layer deeper after the initial sort of punk stuff, what were the initial bands that kind of pulled you in and spoke to you? Further than punk, because I had that layer of punk that was awesome. And I'm glad that I experienced. Absolutely. For sure. Like Green Day. Yep. I loved Green Day so much. And I saw them on the Kerplunk tour. And that was the one where I was like, I love this band. And I love this band at this level, but I want to go deeper than this. Like I like I, Green Day's, they're on the Kerplunk tour. So they're known. They're not known at the scale that they're going to be known at later, but they're known enough. But I wanted to go even further than that and to what I had no clue about, which was Resurrection and Lifetime was the first show that I saw in DC. And that's the one that kind of blew my mind. Just as far as how small it was, how everybody knew each other, the type of show that it was, how emotional Lifetime's lyrics were. And a lot of people don't like the seven inch and background, but I still actually love those records. Those are so good. Those are so good. Thank you for saying that because it's uh, that's an opinion where I bring it up now. Like, are you, are you high? But those are the, I, it's just, there's something about those records that are so hard on your sleeve, almost cringy because it's so on your sleeve and so direct, but that's what I loved about hardcore. Those lyrics, hardcore is not a background beat. What is it? Is that the, I got it completely wrong. I think it's hardcore is not a background beat for you to move your feet. I I'll totally apologize to anyone. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I. I think, it, yeah, it's very earnest because that that's the time and the place, especially when you're putting out your first music, like you really are letting it all out, whatever that may mean and how cringeworthy it is, even six months after the fact, it's just that representation of it. And I think that's why even if you're misplacing, it's, oh yeah, Hello Bastards is infinitely better. And it's yes, from a musical perspective, of course, it's the evolution yeah. of it, but 
dude, what they were doing at that particular junction, you need to put it in context. You can't just listen to it in a vacuum. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so it's hardcore. It's not a background beat for you to move your dancing feet. It's feeling, living, breathing. It's the life for those who love living. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, yeah. Yeah. And you, and to be fair, you were close enough. I knew what you were talking about, but I wasn't going to put myself <laughs> out there trying to quote it as well. And then we just look like two idiots <laughs> stumbling through lyrics. So, yes, exactly. But not the first time I've done it. No, exactly. Yeah. I'm sure you've done it on stage. <laughs> as we all have, maybe. Fair, maybe. fair point. Fair point. Yeah. And did you, I, I guess, uh, there's something you said in there that that resonated with me as well in regards to you observing that everybody knew each other. And I think that's a real important unlocking in your brain when you start to go to shows and you recognize the community that's built up around them. Talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah, you called it 100%. I remember, yeah, I remember going to that show and then the next show I went to, I remember seeing someone there and then them approaching me and then talking about how they had seen me at that lifetime. So you're correct in that aspect. And then also I had the friends that I would go with to the shows that were, that I would skate with. Skating was kind of a priority in the shows we did secondary until shows consumed my life. But uh, so yeah, the social aspect of it was cool. And it was also cool because it was pre-internet. So it's not like I would see these people all the time. They were new and cool and exciting people to me. Whereas everyone else I New in my area, you know the, them in and out. But so yeah, it was exciting to go to shows in DC. And everything, and every time we went to DC, it's at the time. It's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was scary to go to DC at some of those shows. Yeah, itchy. Yeah, when you go to a show on the proverbial other side of the tracks, and you, I know, I, actually, anytime anybody brings sketchy at a show up i always think because i'm almost positive i saw you guys play the pch club here in southern california yeah you did and it that it's like you go to this place and you're just like first of all what am i doing here like second of all the, where's the show like you just i mean that wasn't the first time i attended a show there but i know exactly what you're talking about when you feel that element of danger and it's not in the room where you're seeing a show yeah yes it, but also and there was also that element of danger. There were fights at shows too at the time in DC. And I don't, I would never say that's cool. And I love that because I hate that aspect of hardcore. But at the same time, when I was younger, that made things more exciting to me for sure. This feeling of this is dangerous where I'm at. But I loved it so much that it was to me worth the risk of whether or not I was going to get possibly jumped by somebody at the end of the night because I just loved the bands I was seeing so much. Truly. Yeah, so. absolutely. And because of the way that you've described your relationship with your parents, were they ever concerned in regards to the type of stuff that you were bringing home and the idea that you wanted to start bands and you wanted to sing in a band? Were they, did they just obviously let you do your thing because clearly you did it, but were, was that a, a cause for concern as it were? No, I don't, no, they never really, I think that I really tried to put that part of my life, I tried to block that away from them. You know what I'm saying? I didn't really tell sure. them. They knew I was singing for a band, but I wouldn't really tell them, you know, I'm singing for a band. This is what we sing about and this and that. But they were psyched when we went on tour. They were supportive. And when we rolled through, they were stationed at Texas at the time again. And when we rolled through Texas, we stayed with them. They were excited when we went to Europe. So they were just excited for us. And my dad still has a Count Me Out shirt that he wears. And my mom has a Cloak Dagger shirt that she wears. Respect. I go see them. Yeah, it's cool. I just think they could just probably see it in me how much I loved it. So they probably just wanted to support me and trying to get whatever it was out of this thing that I want. The, they saw that you were passionate about something, and I think that's probably mostly where parents sit. Is just the idea that, like, as long as my kid cares about something, I feel I feel good about that. As yeah. long as it's not destructive, clearly. Yeah, it's hard because sometimes I think about it now having a baby. Sometimes I think about the environments at the shows that I was at and I want my daughter there. But yeah, it's something that we did, that I definitely lived through. But I don't know if I would 100% encourage. So you're like, <laughs> yeah, listen, I know what shows are like. You're, I'm not sending you out to this one. Yeah, within reason. I think that in the future, it will be something where I'll try to go training wheel style if she's interested in doing anything like that, not dive into the house show with. 50 people moshing in a place that holds 60. Yep. Just, yeah, so. right. Yeah, training wheels. I like that. I'm going to guess that Count Me Out isn't your first band or was it? It is. Jason, that's not fair. Come on, dude. We had a, I, I did do another band that we just practiced and then we played one show and it was just more of a, you can open up this show. 
And uh, we opened up and we covered Inside Out. We covered No Spiritual Surrender. Everyone always fucks up No Spiritual Surrender when they cover it. And we did. But yeah, that was, uh, Count Me Out was my first band. That's awesome. That's, uh, it's just, it's cool. I know that most people, I know that Indecision obviously re-released the very first EP. I know a lot of people weren't really aware that thing existed. Even that, like, for ostensibly what is probably, would be considered maybe your demo, like, that, like, it doesn't suck. It's good. Like, so that's, yeah, you're welcome. We did a demo before that, before the Ambassador release. And okay. That demo is truly demo quality. Like, it's me not knowing what my voice is yet. I got this wrong on another podcast I went to, but the studio we went to is called Nothing But Noise in Northern Virginia. And they had recorded For the Living. And that's the band that kind of took me under their wing and let me go and roadie for them with Better Than a Thousand. And that's the band that kind of opened my eyes to the world of touring. And that's what gave me the drive to want to just be in a have that just be my everything. Got it. Was after that Better Than a Thousand tour. But um, yeah, we did that EP and I was happy with how that came out. And a large part of that's due to Brian McTurnan recording it. Yeah. And oh, being yeah. like our, our guiding light through that and filtering out what's cool and what's not cool and what's sounds good. And uh, so, yeah, I think if, had we not gotten together with Brian, things would have gotten to gone very differently for our band. Yeah. Oh, I can understand that. And especially too, from the, just the simple sonic recording of the music, I think that's what makes those records, in my opinion, and I think many other people's opinions, very timeless, where it's like, you can tell that it, or you cannot tell exactly what year it was recorded, where certain ones where you're like, oh yeah, this is 2001 or whatever. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. I yeah. was, when I went and revisited it, when I went and listened to Permanent the last time, I was happy with how it sounded. Yeah. Which, yeah. That's awesome. How did you even, how did you even get hick, hooked up with Ambassador in the first place? So Collision came through on a tour of the East Coast and they played some shows. And one of them that they played was at Pete, our guitar player's house. So Pete had booked a house show for them. They played Pete's mom's house in the suburbs with the first step, Count Me Out played, another Virginia band called Landmark. And the show went over awesome. And there was a ton of people there. And uh, it was a house show, so a ton of people was relative, but the show had a good turnout. And I think Collision liked us enough. And Steve Hertz that played in Collision, he was doing Ambassador Records with Ryan Hoffman. And we sent them, we sent out a bunch of uh, the Few and Far Between EP. We sent them, we sent that out to a bunch of different labels. It was just a recording of that EP. And Ambassador said that they would put it out. And when they said they would put it out, I felt like we got signed to warner brothers i was oh yeah it was the million. <laughs> so, i can imagine because it, it, it is it, i know that time frame especially of, with a lot of the attention that ambassador was putting into putting out bands and they definitely were hitting for a moment of people paying attention to what they were doing so i just remember yeah. especially being from southern california being like what's this band from richmond doing on ambassador and then listening to it i'm like oh i get it why but yeah. oh it's cool but you yeah. know what band was on ambassador that we loved Circle Storm. Of course. Dude, <laughs> yeah, duh. I mean, are you kidding me? I was so excited to be part of that. And then I think, I don't know if the Statue record came out before or after. I think it came out before also. Yeah, I think that may have been the first Ambassador release, just to kind okay. of what the whistle of everybody was there. Okay. This is what we got coming up. I'm not, we're talking about <laughs> things that are relevant to negative four people. <laughs> so, so as you started to get out there and play shows, was it a comfortable for you to, I guess, be a front man? Because there clearly does come some baggage in regards to that and i don't mean that in a like dramatic sense of the term but just yeah. the idea of people paying attention to you and having to be outgoing when you might not feel like being outgoing was that difficult or did it i guess come easy to you no it's weird it came easy to me because i was just so excited to be playing i'm sure everyone's seen the bands where the singer is just almost too excited to be playing that was me i was pumped to be playing no matter where we were playing I was just so excited. And I think that was something that people, I have won people over with, I think, for some of the shows that we played because we were honestly playing shows to 20 people, but I was losing it. Like we were playing to a show to 500 people. Totally. I was just so happy to be playing. But it's funny because that's when I was so outgoing at that time. And I was just so loving, wanting to talk to people and hang out with everybody. But as time went on, I just wanted to not do that. And I just wanted to be with 
my core group of friends and not really be social and just do my own thing until it was time to play. And then I would have all that energy come out during our set. And then I would just go back to being by myself or with friends. And so it's, I just flip-flopped. I didn't, I went from an extrovert to an introvert pretty quickly as far as playing shows go. Yeah. I I really like the self-awareness in regards to just the excitement like that was your north star and that's what you were focused on just because i can't believe i'm here i can't believe i get to do this i just i like that element of it because not only is it that sort of youthful exuberance but just the idea that every show was a gift and i know it sounds like you should get a wood carving thing up on your wall for that or whatever but yeah no i feel that really every time we played i was so psych to play to a certain point i think after a while you do it enough times you're on a tour that you know not every show is like that but i really every time we recorded i would just take it in this is probably the last time that you're going to record so you might as well photograph everything everyone there are other people in county out that would almost make fun of me for doing that because i was so wanting to capture that moment because i appreciated it so much but now it's awesome to go look at the, the go look at the photo books that have photos that capture those memories. It's awesome. And I'm glad that I did. I'm glad that I appreciated it when I did. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, it, the uh, I'm guessing, because uh, at that time when you guys were most active in touring and putting out music, there was this sort of tipping of the pendulum where there were bands that were able to quote unquote make it. And I use that in air quotes from what being like a full-time touring band and whether that meant just like spending seven months out of the year touring and then coming home and working at their local record store or bagel shop or whatever. Yeah. What, I'm guessing just because of the way that you articulated it previously, that was the space that you wanted to live in. And was that was that like your primary focus during those years where it's, oh yeah, everything else, yeah, art will always be there, but I'm really just focused on the band. Yeah, it was. I turned down jobs because I didn't want to work. I did not want to work a full-time job that wouldn't give me the freedom to tour when I wanted to. And so what I did was I really made life hard for myself. But now I think you could find that balance. But back then I just thought it's got to be one or the other. I can't have a good job and I can't tour whenever I want to. But Count Me Out didn't tour. We didn't tour full time. We just toured full time on breaks full time because Pete was still in school. And so we would tour during the summertime. We would tour during spring break. We would tour during the winter time. But uh, it was never to the level of touring that I wanted to do. But it was also enough to keep it exciting. But yeah, I didn't want to take any employment that would prevent me from being able to accept that tour that never happened. <laughs> totally. I, hey guys, I'm open in case that in case that call from in my eyes happens. Here we go, guys. Let's do this. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Bet MGM, an authorized gaming partner of the NBA, welcomes basketball fans with a slam dunk offer. Simply place a ten dollar money line wager on any game. If either team hits a three pointer, you'll automatically receive two hundred dollars in bonus bets. Just use bonus code JERSEY200 when you place your bet. Enjoy this NBA season like never before with a variety of parlay selection features, player props, and the best daily promotions in the business. Download the app or go to betmgm.com and use bonus code JERSEY200 to win $200 in bonus bets if either team hits a three-pointer in the game you wager on. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. New Jersey only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. First online real money wager only. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable bonus bets. Bonus bets expire seven days from issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Do you feel rich? Do you feel Friday night rich? Every Friday night, you can get a grilled steak and a fresh lobster tail for just $24.99. Kick off your weekend in style. Only at TGI Fridays. And what I found interesting uh, about the way that Account Me Out developed is that clearly you worked with Ambassador, you worked with Indecision, and you guys really truly found a home out west here where people were engaged with what you were doing. And your trips out here and the shows that you played out here always seemed to resonate. I presume that you also felt that as well, or was it, hey, when we play the East Coast, it's very similar to what we experience on the West Coast or vice versa? You're right. I think that California definitely, we have great memories of shows there, but also to us, California was the dream. Literally, that was our band's goal 
was to play California. Okay. You know, that's what we wanted more than anything. We want to get to California, the home of chain. We want to play shows in California. And so I think people, yeah, I think people could see that excitement in us when we played. And I remember a lot of great shows there. I think that on the East Coast, there were pockets. We would do good in Pennsylvania. We would do good in Jersey. We would do good sometimes in Richmond. Sometimes we wouldn't. It was just hard to tell whether or not we would. But but yeah, those California shows are great. That's awesome. The I know, like you were mentioning earlier, recording with M- McTurnan and having him be such an instrumental part in documenting your records. I'm sure, like you said, when you first were recording with him, he probably was able to help you, like you said, be like, okay, this is cool. This isn't cool. I'm sure you have those moments of especially probably recording vocals because that's really uncomfortable recording vocals, yeah. especially in a hardcore band. I'm sure you have some memories that stick out in regards to, oh, like this is how I should do something or something funny that Brian bestowed upon you about how to handle something in the so, studio. On the EP, we had this song called Few and Far Between. And at the end, it ended with me saying, few and far between. And I said, Brian, I want you to put the Chain of Strength echo vocals on that at the end. So it sounds, and now I'm stronger. And he said, no, that's whack. <laughs> just <laughs> no, we're not having a discussion about this. It's just whack. He just said, I know you think it's a good idea now, but trust me, it's not a good idea. <laughs> so and he's right. It wasn't a good idea. And then some other times, Brian, punch me in here. I'm going to do a little talking part over this breakdown. And we would try it. And then it would just be, nah, that's not cool. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So there was things like that was, that happened with 110 and especially with the EP. And a lot of that was through the learning process of the of recording at a real studio for the first time with the few and far between EP was trying to test out all of these things. But yeah, no, that's, yeah I'm glad that that's he's awesome. the one that ended up working with us and in recording our records. Cause I really fear what would have happened if we didn't go with him, we would come out with records that didn't sound as good and maybe didn't have the same time and attention put to them. And then we would have just broken up after the EP. So it's cool that he gave our band legs and respect amongst other people to check it out because it's the band that Brian worked with. So they must be good. And I'd like to hear them. So yeah, absolutely. And so when Count Me Out started to tour less, as far as taking those spring, summer, winter break tours, that because I, mean, I know pretty quickly thereafter is when you started to do Cloak Dagger, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were doing Renee Hartfeld and Pete was doing Renee Hartfeld with Call. And after Count Me Out broke up, they had the. They had the thought of starting Renee Hartfelt when Count Me Out was going strong. We were having good shows, but also having this feeling of things are going to wind down soon. Got it. So you got to start your next move, which my next move was to just move to D.C. and try to get away from everybody to find a full-time job because I was ready to enter the workforce. Okay, got it. Put that part of my life behind me, but it's just something that I'm glad wasn't fully behind me because what happened was Pete and Colin, they started Renee Hartfelt and that went for a couple of years while I was in DC. And if Pete showed up late to practice, then Colin Barth on guitar and Colin Kimball on drums for Renee Hartfelt, they came up with the Cloak Dagger songs and asked me to sing for that and just said, we're going to be We're going to do a band. It's going to be called Cloak Dagger. It's going to be spelled Cloak slash Dagger. Yep. And we want you to sing for it. And I didn't, I was nervous to try to dive into singing again because I loved Count Me Out. And I didn't want to start this new chapter not knowing where it was going to go to. But I'm really happy that I did. Yeah. And it sounds too, just in, I know this was many this was a while ago when I, I personally approached you just being the nerd that I was being like, oh man, like you should come on the podcast. And you were reticent. You were kind of like, oh man, like I don't, you weren't articulating this. I was reading this in my own voice, in my own head. But <laughs> you were reluctant. Do you remember your reticence in regards to just whether it was the comfort level of you presenting yourself and maybe not being the Al Bundy, like a high school touchdown game or whatever? Was it that kind of feeling you didn't really want to I guess, go down that rabbit hole, not like only with me, but just in general. It's a mix of things. Yes. One, that's for sure. Part of it is because, yeah, I don't like that. People do that. And I don't like it when people recreate bands that they've done before that have been better in the past, with new versions of that. And um, as far as talking to someone now, I love to talk to people and we've done this. We've done the Where When podcast now for close to two years. So I'm more comfortable speaking. But even now, before we started this, I got nervous. It's just something where I think there's a lot of people that are involved in podcasting that are extroverts and they're 
good at speaking and articulating their thoughts. And me, and you saw when we talked about the background lyric, it's something where I just stammered and thought, oh, I messed that up. Oh my God. That's how I feel every time we record one of the episodes for where it went, but I just get nervous speaking. It's something where I get nervous about talking about some of the things we talked about with my family, but I love my family. Why shouldn't I tell people that they're awesome? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's just one of those things where you don't want to offend anybody or say something to put somebody off. But at the same time, through doing our own podcast, I realized like if someone's offended, then it's not necessarily your fault. Sure. You know what I mean, that's more, it's more on them than it is you because you weren't, you're not expressing this to be malicious towards anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I just get nervous about it. I just get nervous in general. I'm not really, I'm not really <laughs> an outgoing. It's so weird because I sing for a band, but I mean, you've talked to enough people and I've heard conversations that you've had with others where they're shy people. And it's just, it's just part of sometimes singers' personalities is that you can be quiet, but yet you're loud on stage. Yeah. And you can, it's a lot harder to have a level-headed conversation with someone for me than it is to get on stage and just yell because you just tune everything out when you're on stage and when you're speaking to somebody, it's just different. And I guess, I guess I got nervous about that, but yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to romanticize the past too much. It's fun too. I love talking about it, but at the same time, I don't want to Al Bundy myself. Yeah. And I think it's the fact that we are able to even enter that frame of thought, I think puts us in a space where, you know, neither you or I or people's opinions that we trust will do that because like just the simple thought of it will make you be like, oh no, I'm not like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But like, <laughs> this doesn't feel right doing like a song by song breakdown of 110. It's like, I don't know about that. I'm not saying you have every right to do that if you do. I was just using that as an example. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. And I think to your point of just the idea that the space in which you can express yourself, obviously on stage where they're like, it, it's so instinctual. Like you're just running off of adrenaline and like how you articulated before excitement and you're not putting any thought into it it's just oh yeah this is what like i want to do and i can jump around and express myself like this but also i listen to your podcast weekly we don't hang out you know what i'm saying but i know you through the podcast like i trust you i know your sense of humor i know some of your likes and your dislikes and so it's one of those things where yeah i listen to your podcast every week why wouldn't i want to come and hang out and talk to you about the hardcore. It sounds awesome. No. And it, it's fun. But uh, there was something else that I was going to say. I'm completely blanking on what it is right now. That's okay. You're just an absolute amateur. It's okay, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I was going to say, we do the Where It Went podcast and there's guests that we wish would come and talk to us. And I think, why don't you come and talk to us and tell your story that people are interested in hearing about? Yep. And have it documented while well, you can have it documented in the context of doing it from a scale of you're doing everything from start to finish and people that played an important part in those in the history of that record label for revelation records it's disappointing when they don't want to come talk to us because it's something that we would be psyched on but it's also something that everybody would be psyched on and what you're doing and recording these people's stories and their experiences is something that's hopefully archived for years to come after they're gone. I'd hate to say it like that, but I can get morbid when it comes to those sort of things. And I'm happy for the time that we have. And I love all the people that came before us that put their heart and soul into what they were doing. And it's, it's just something where I thought, yeah, so let me come and talk to Ray because I'd like to. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's that. I think it, I agree with you. The, I think for me, the most important part is the, the development of context. Cause I, I think that in the digital world that we exist in, it's difficult to get context and not one podcast or a podcast plus a zine or whatever form it takes. Yeah. We'll be able to paint the picture, but it can at least get you part of the way there to where you're able to understand why people do what they do. And then ultimately why they create the art that they create, even though you're only getting a snippet of that. Yeah, that's true. With a few last things I wanted to hit on with, with Cloak Dagger, I always found it very honestly endearing and engaging the fact that you were not writing off the idea that you were, it's like, oh, here's this cool super group, X members, <laughs> all these bands and like really didn't make a deal out of it. And then obviously the relationships that you created and putting out stuff with Jade Tree and then all the partnerships that you've done with Bridge Nine and everything else from a release perspective seems so deliberate and thoughtful. I'm going to guess that a lot of that was very intentional from you guys pretty much from the get-go. Well, we didn't do anything with Bridge Nine. 
We just did we just did J Tree and we did Great Mistake, which is our friend Alex DiMatessa's label that did Government Warning. He played bass for Government Warning and he also he played in some other bands, he filled in some others, but he put out a string of great records. And that's who we put out our seven inch with. And then uh for the LP, we went with J Tree and it was intentional as far as we didn't want to be signed to a label that we thought would hype up our ex members status of. It's just not something that we want. But um, also J Tree had their, they had a 50% royalty rate at the time. Total profit split. Yep. Yeah. Which was modeled after touch and go and discord. And uh, it's something that we were, we thought would be good for us. And uh, me personally, J Tree had put out so many records that I loved. I put out the culture shock LP by four walls, damnation, no more dreams, strike anywhere, changes the sound jets to Brazil, just all over the place. They're a label that I love the fucked up LP. Oh yeah. That had come up, that come out like shortly before we put out RLP. So yeah, it was intentional as far as that goes. Yeah. I was just excited to work with them. Yeah, absolutely. It's a fun thing to be able to put out releases with different important historical labels for especially your own upbringing where it's like, hey, I can work with these labels that not only still exist, but then they're actually interested in putting out my music. Wow. Weird. Yeah, dude, I was excited. And now... Since they were bought out by Epitaph, if you look on streaming, it'll have Epitaph. Epitaph, yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. You're like, no big deal. I'm signing yeah, Epitaph, guys. Guys <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Got the records on Epitaph. But, uh, totally. Yeah. It, it, in transitioning into quote unquote civilian life, as it were, like you said, you were developing your design chops with your band, flyers, all that sort of stuff. So was it was it difficult to make that transition where you were applying your art talents to things that might not have had a emotional connection to beyond just this is obviously a job it's so different it's always different when you're working with a band it's just so much more fun something for when i'm doing graphics for a blender it's it's just sure. not, it's just not the same yeah but uh, no i'm happy that i have the skills that i can do that i can do design work on a, on that level but at the same time it's never as exciting as when you're working with a band who trusts you and is letting you steer the ship as far as their vision goes to try to go with what works for them and i'm always thankful that bands have given me the chance to do that even if it's just t-shirts it's still fun to work with people on t-shirts but yeah i would have never learned how to do that sort of thing to the scale that i have if i wasn't working on flyers and trying to figure out what looked best for the seven inch layouts with airs that's the bad part is that i've worked with some i've done some things where i'm not fully proud of it when i look back on it but at the same time it's just like anything, it's just learning experiences and you've got to fail to have your have your needs. Sure. And I guess maybe on the flip side of that idea, do you find or have you thought about the the lack of emotional connection that you could have with a blender? Like it it may be easier <laughs> to do that because you're like, I don't care about this Vitamix or whatever in the same yeah. way that I care about the first chain of strength seven inch. Yeah, so, exactly. So it is. could be easier. It is for a hundred percent. And there's no way I would do, I would never go through, and I'm not saying this for anybody that I'll work with in the future, but there's no way I would do 20 revisions on a, on a food processor graphic. (laughs) Totally. But do and I'm sure you've maybe seen this throughout your travels within the art design community. I'm sure you have run across people that clearly have a connection to punk hardcore and DIY just because that's, there's that connective tissue that gets pulled through there or maybe you haven't no i definitely have always the most creative and the coolest people that are doing things on a larger scale working for the coolest companies there's always some sort of thread there that's related to hardcore punk always and that might just be because it's what speaks to me and it's what i think is the coolest but it always seems to be the case that there's oh yeah that dude i knew him he used to go to shows and boston area or new york or dc or whatever it's happened all the time i can't think of them i can't think of any off the top of my head right now that i could name by name but it's just something where i'm never surprised when there's someone putting out creative things that i love that have come from a hardcore punk background or maybe it's you're actively looking for it too it's like every every email you're sending you have an a, attachment for your current playlist or whatever <laughs> <laughs> you're sending out the signal Go- yeah google's google's picking up on what i like anyway so that's why they're sending me this totally Rip- <laughs> that's incredible the i promise the last two things were like you've mentioned a, a few times throughout the podcast of the, the where it went 
the Revelation Records podcast, where you document each record from a chronological perspective. I'm sure that it has led you down not only rabbit holes on specific releases where it's, dude, I didn't think we could spend two and a half hours on Iceburn, but here we are. (laughs) If there is one episode that you personally were either proud of or that you would point people to, to be like, okay, I understand that you might not care about Revelation as much as, you know, I do. Try this episode. Get a little sampler, as it were. I would tell people to check out the Mike Judge and Old Smoke episode. Okay. Because that's just such a mysterious release and it's coming from Mike is just such a down to earth, open person with us on that episode. And that's someone who's, for lack of a better word, a hero of mine since I was, what, 16 or 17 years old. And for him to open up the way that he did with us about that record, which is very special to him, I think comes across. So I think even if you're not really jazzed about Revelation Records, maybe you would just listen to that episode and appreciate the story to those, some of those releases. It is. The story behind it. Yeah, it is funny where it's like it, the, in my opinion, it's like the more underappreciated, under-celebrated, overlooked or whatever. Like those are the ones that you could probably find. Like there's a reason that they exist. And yeah. sometimes it's as simple as, oh, it's just a friend putting it out. But then sometimes there's like this really layered uh, story beyond it. And that's where you're probably going to find more interesting and introspective discussions rather than the whatever foundational releases of yeah. a label. But those are, the, to me, the ones that are the most exciting to do are the ones where we don't know anything about the releases, really. And hearing the stories behind them, sometimes that can be really gratifying. But there's some, there's, it's always awesome to talk about youth today. It's right. always awesome to talk about Girl Biscuits. And, but at the same time, yeah, some of the ones that are just lesser known are the ones that have really surprised me with how engaging they are. Yeah. Also, how much I've learned to love some of those records. Yeah. The ones that I passed the first time around and that didn't click with me. Maybe some of them have clicked with me now. So it's been cool to do. It's been fun. Yeah. The re- the revisitation of it can be like, you know what? Like Spark Marker, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the Like you mentioned, you are a new father and you are navigating that world now, which is always interesting and daunting for people that have come from our world that's oh yeah i knew i wanted a kid at some point but like here i am and i I personally still feel like a child myself i guess i'll keep this thing alive so how are you reflecting i know that your child is very young so there's the rearing is a survival nature at this point but how are you reflecting on fatherhood and the idea of the where you have come up in regards to the DIY stuff and whatever rebelling against the system and all of those kind of cliched ideas, but that are very important to yeah. our scene. I think we're, I'm lucky enough. When I say we're, me and Catherine are lucky enough to have close friends that are, have also raised children, but then also still have that question, question everything, do what you want to lifestyle, namely our good friends, Matt and Mehe, who are like family to me, and their daughter, Cammy, they're in the band No Man Together, and Matt sang and played guitar for Majority Rule. I mean, they were the ones that kind of opened my eyes up to, you can have a child, but you can still do what it is that you want to do, and you don't have to compromise your view on what's your outlook on society. I can still think things are fucked up for better for my daughter, but still be a good father, because I see it in them as parents. And yeah, it's been unreal. And it's something that I never thought I would take the step and do. And for the longest time, I thought, God, the way babies smell. And I, <laughs> so, I, I hate the way that they look. And I hate, I never want to have a baby, but I can see the qualities in Catherine that she's going to be an amazing mother. And 100%, she's been just unreal. And she's the one that's just so patient with Ramona. I'm also patient because I love her, but my patience is just not nearly as long lasting right yeah i I don't know it's just Catherine. she's just such a great mother and i'm so glad that we decided to take the step to do it when we did in fact we maybe put it off too long but uh, yeah ramona was born to the hospital that she was born in they said yeah you can make a playlist if you want to and you can play music when during the oh yeah to deliver it when she's when she's delivered and yeah i set off the playlist and when i set off that playlist things went fast and uh, yeah playlist started with drab majesty and ended with bikini kill and it was just unreal nice 
I thought you were maybe going to play infest front to back. <laughs> just, hey guys, we're going to set, set the tone of the room. People are like, what the hell? Jason, shut now, that off. Now wait, can we just chill in the delivery room for a second? Just how much is about to come on? Just, I love that idea because especially when you're younger, you have this idea. It's, oh man, it would be so cool to have a life partner that like loves hardcore too. And then we'll like, listen to hardcore when we go home and listen to hardcore when we have dinner. It's just like, the hell are you talking? Like, that is such a 16 year old idea. <laughs> oh. Dude, Catherine has no love for hardcore. Oh, good. You're like, I got enough for both of us. We're fine. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're good. I got this covered. And that's good because then you can learn from her and then she can just look at you and be like, I guess that's cool, Jason. Whatever you're doing over there, buddy, that's fine. <laughs> Yes. Jason, thank you so much for hanging out. Honestly, I knew this was going to be great. And you did great. You're a professional podcaster, whether you like it or uh, not. I, I'm not, but thank you for the <laughs> patience. And really, thank you for the countless hours of enjoyment you've given me through the years. I've been listening to 100 Words or Less for, oh my God, years. So thanks for all the time that you put into it. Such a fun one, right? Isn't Jason just just the coolest? I love to joke around with him and um, yeah, just have fun with him. So now we're uh, texting friends and real life friends, all that other stuff, because, um, you know, that's what I do when I invite people on the podcast. I become their friend, whether they like it or not. <laughs> Anyways, next week, I am incredibly excited to release a, a two-parter, as it were. This is part of the live podcast that I did over in the greater Manchester area of the United Kingdom at Outbreak Fest. I am bringing you a discussion I had with uh, Nate from Zabalba and Brian from Knocked Loose. And trust me, live podcasts, I, I get it. Anytime that a person releases a live podcast in the world, you're you're trying to balance <laughs> between playing for the audience and then obviously being concerned about the listener at home. But trust me, I really was proud of these discussions. And I think that regardless if you were there or not, because, you know, let's be honest, a majority, I'd say 99.9% .9 of you were not there, uh, you will still find a lot of value out of these discussions. So two-parter, that's what I'm releasing next week. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to share that with you. So until then, please be safe, everybody. You know what it's like to endlessly seek a remedy. Are you ready for a prescription that's once daily steroid-free? Vitama Tepinarov Cream 1% is a prescription topical treatment for adults with plaque psoriasis. Do not use if you're allergic to Vitama Cream. The most common side effects of Vitama Cream include red raised bumps around the hair pores, pain or swelling in the nose and throat, skin rash or irritation, including itching and redness, peeling, burning or stinging, headache, itching and flu. Tell your doctor about all the medicines you take, and if you are pregnant or plan to be, ask your doctor if Vitama Cream is right for you. You deserve more from your topical. To learn more, visit topicaluprising.com. 92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? Not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Your favorite podcast, Therapy for Black Girls, is celebrating five years of empowering conversations as we continue to make mental health and wellness accessible. In addition to weekly chats with some of your favorite mental health professionals and other experts, we've flipped through the pages of your favorite romance novels with author Tia Williams, checked in with Grammy Award winning artist Michelle Williams, and talked hurdles in sports, motherhood, and mental health with Olympic athlete Natasha Hastings. From our team to your podcast app, join us in celebrating five years of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. Check it out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.